this is Kathleen De La Hunt and it's Let's Chat on Wednesday morning again and I'm very excited to be with you. The topic of the conversation this morning on Let's Chat is mourning well, how to mourn well. You know, we're living in a time where people's hearts are broken and we have to understand how we can live through this live through this and turn it to good the way that God intended so that we can once again walk in the victory we were created to walk in. But before I start, I would love to just pray for you this morning and trust God for just such an anointing on the word and also for those listening in the room where they are listening. Father God, I commit this message to you. I commit this teaching to you. I commit myself to you. I pray for your presence to just brood over me. I want to thank you for the Holy Spirit to brood over me as I teach this morning. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of revelation, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of the Lord and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. I want to thank you that my words are clear that people can receive them and that they will bring life and hope and joy and peace into the lives of those whose hearts are broken. Jesus, your words say that you, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, for he has anointed me to preach the good news and to heal the brokenhearted. And this morning as I share on mourning and mourning well, that is the anointing, the balm, the honey balm, that I'm praying will be released into the hearts of the brokenhearted today through the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, it's an honor to be with you. And as I was praying about what God wanted me to teach this morning, he gave me this message. He said, teach my people to mourn well. Friends, for us to be able to mourn well and to work through loss and to work through the hopelessness of loss, we have to have a revelation of eternity. If we do not have a revelation of eternity, a deep revelation that our life on earth is just a temporary visitation with a comma, but that there is eternal life in eternity, if we do not have that revelation, then death is a terrible thing and a terrible sting and it destroys our hearts. But it says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55 and 56, where is the sting of death? Once we have a revelation of who Jesus is and about what he's done for us, for our eternity and for our eternal destiny. You know, it says in um, Psalm 139 from verse 13 to 15, it says that we were fearfully, wonderfully made and that every day ordained for us was written in his book before one of them came into being. So I want you to understand that, to get a revelation of the fact that every person on earth has a lifespan. We have a starting day and we have a day of leaving. We have a day when we were created to be born on this earth with a purpose and a plan. But there's also the day where we will be taken home. Now, if we understand that there is a lifespan and no one says how long that lifespan is, that lifespan for some may be a couple of months. For some may not even be a couple of months. They might only have been conceived. I remember when my daughter lost her baby, her baby in womb, and God said, gave me that scripture. He said that every day ordained was written in my book before one of them came to be. But we have to be conceived in this world, on this earth, to be able to be part of the next era and the next season. And so there are People that have been conceived and created in the womb in this season and in this time. But their eternal destiny and the days ordained for them weren't for this era. It was for the next era. And there are those that God removes and takes home to be with them because eternity is their destiny. But they had to have a starting point. Now, so friends, there is a starting day, but there's also a leaving day. And we don't know what that lifespan is for us. And we don't know what that lifespan is for different people. But one thing that I do know is that when people come to the end of their God-given lifespan, be that a short lifespan or a long lifespan, there's a sense inside of every single one of them that says, 
I need to get my life in order. I need to get things in order. And I have spent many, 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 many hours next to people that are dying and next to deathbed and with people that have lost loved ones. I'm a nursing sister by profession. My first month of nursing, I was next to 18 deathbeds and I have been next to many, many ever since then. And I believe it's just part of the calling of being able to be with people in those last hours so that they can encounter their eternal destiny with Jesus Christ. And the one thing that I have found common with those that have come to the end of their lifespan. And friends, when you come to the end of your lifespan, it, this earth is finished for you. And when they've come to that, there's always been the sense, as people have looked back over their life, they've seen that in the previous few months, there was a sense of making things right, getting things ready, putting things in order. It was almost, in the words are, it's almost as if they knew. What well, I think the kindness of God is that he does tell us. He may not say you're about to die or you're about to come home, but he gives that sense of get things in order because the season is finished. I can tell you so many testimonies, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of testimonies of people that have come to the end of their lifespan and prepared for the next season, which is in eternity. But then the Bible also says that the enemy can steal our lives, friends. It says in John 10 verse 9 and 10 that the enemy comes to steal, to kill and to destroy. He can cause us to lose our life prematurely. But to be able to do that, he needs to find a way to steal it. He cannot just stop it. He cannot just take it. We have to give an open door for him to steal that. It says in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, Your enemy the devil prowls around looking for someone to devour. So he's looking for a way in. If we give him a way in, he will take that way in to try and cut our life short. But the most incredible thing about that. That is when God gives us the opportunity to pray for people and for them to come back. And having seen two men come back to life, being resurrected after death, both of them certified dead, coming back to life. Having seen a baby that was dead in the wombs for three weeks, completely scanned, proving the baby was not alive, but couldn't be removed because the mother wasn't healthy enough, and suddenly pop back into life. I asked God about that. God, when can we ask people to come back? And he said, when their lives have been cut short, he's prepared to give them a second chance to come back. So friends, we need to be there to be able to call people back if God says their lifespan has not come to an end yet. I also want to say this. I'm, I'm, I'm talking deeply. This is a deep conversation today. But I'm trusting that in, as I unpack this, and this is just my introduction, that I will be able to help some people come through the season of mourning and find their peace. God has, is raising up a people in this era and this time that can hear him to know when they are to go and pray for people because their season had not come to an end, but they were stolen from. And when to know that people's lives have come to an end. Every time that I'm asked to pray for somebody, I say, God, is this the end of their lifespan? Or is there something that you want to intervene here because the enemy is trying to steal from them? And on many occasions, not every occasion, God will say to me, pray earnestly and he will give me a word where there was a hopeless situation. And many times they've been considered brain dead. They've been considered there's no chance whatsoever. And God says, pray. Because this is not their end. Call them back. And yet there have been other times where people have not even appeared to be so sick or so desperate. And I've been praying and God has said, don't pray. Their time is over. And so it's really important, friends, that we tune in to hear God. But it's also really important that we have a revelation of eternity. Because our hearts will not be so broken when we have a revelation that our time on this earth is just a comma. And that we have eternity together. And there's a cloud of witnesses that are allowed to watch the good things that are happening on this earth. That are able to watch the glorious things that we do on behalf of our King. And that our King Jesus is with every one of our loved ones. But he's also with us. He is a, he is a contact. We can talk to him about those that we love and that we miss. I just want to say that to you. Now the Bible says in Proverbs 29 verse 2. As the righteous grow powerful, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, people mourn. Friends, we are in a time of desperate mourning. And half the reason for that desperate mourning is because wicked people are ruling. There's so much wickedness that's going on. And it's the wickedness 
that is happening in the earth that is causing the heartache, the brokenness, the mourning, the tragedy, the loss that so much of the world is experiencing in this time. The world is in mourning and we have to know how to live through it, how to cope through it and how to be able to bring people through to be able to continue life into the fullness of their glory. People are mourning an era gone. You know, at the end of 19, 2019, God said it was the end of an era. It's never going to be like that again. It's interesting that, that when it came to 1920, it was the end of an era. And there was a whole new era that was birthed in the 1920s. And there's a whole new era that's been birthed in the 2020s. They're mourning what was. People are mourning the lives of those that have died. There's been so much death all over the world. There's been so much death. People are mourning the loss of income and the loss of businesses. People are mourning the loss of homes. People are mourning the loss of relationships through divorce. People are mourning the loss of friends. The world is in a season of mourning friends and we have to know what to do with that. But you know, it's so amazing because it says in Matthew 5 verse 4, Blessed are those who mourn. Another word for mourning is who grieve. For they will be comforted. Jesus says himself, blessed are you when you're in a time of mourning because you will be comforted. Now that word comfort is the word parakaleo. And para means to be near and kaleo means to call or to call by name. So Jesus is saying, when you are in a time of mourning, when your heart is broken, when you don't understand, I want you to know, I am the one that is very near to you and I'm calling you by name. Friends, Jesus had great compassion on people in times of loss. I just want to read a scripture to you in Luke 7 verse 13 to 14. It says, when the Lord saw her, the mother whose only son had died, he felt compassion for her and he told her, you can stop crying. Then he went and he touched the bier. And he said, young man, I say to you, get up. Now the word compassion means to have sympathy, pity or empathy. Now, I want you to understand this. When I was nursing, one of the things they used to say to us as nurses, we do not want you to operate out of sympathy. We want you to operate out of empathy. The difference between sympathy and empathy, friends, is that sympathy is pity that keeps people in a pit. But empathy is a feeling of, I know where you come from. I know what you're experiencing. I know what is happening in your life. I feel your pain. Now let me help you get out of the pit. And that's what compassion was that Jesus felt. Many times it said Jesus felt compassion. And many times it was when he saw loss, when he saw heartache, when he saw brokenness. But every single time he showed empathy. He did not show pity. He didn't go there and say, oh, shame, I'm so sorry, and walk on. He showed empathy. He loved them. He felt their pain. He wept with them. And then he said, come, let me help you out of the pit. And that is the responsibility of every one of us, friends. I want to tell you now, mourning is part of our lives. Every one of us are going to experience mourning repeatedly through our lives. But we need people around us that have empathy that understand where we're at, but can help us to come out of that pit. So Jesus operated in that incredibly beautifully. Now in times of mourning, friends, we feel an incredible deep pain. We feel as if we are completely alone. We feel as if we need to withdraw, nobody understands. We feel as if the world continues, but our world has been arrested. There's nothing beyond this point. It is an incredible shock to the emotions. When something tragic happens, when something happens that's a loss, and it doesn't matter what sort of a loss, it is a shock. It happens suddenly. It's like, oh! And exactly the same with an injury of the arm or the leg, the break of an arm or leg, or cutting through the muscles of an arm or leg. There's that suddenly that has happened inside the soul and your emotions have been arrested. And we have to understand this. You know, many years ago, I cut, I was about 16, I cut through my thumb with the top of a tin. I was opening a, a tin of canned fruit. 
and it went through the artery and all the nerves and it went right deep right through and the blood just shot up and hit the roof and they sutured it up and it was healed on the outside but it took many 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 years for the nerves to reconnect and for the nerves to behave normally for many years this thumb had weird sensations with the nerve i couldn't trust the thumb because the nerves were not operating correctly now friends that's on the outside but that's what happens to our soul our soul gets arrested our emotions get arrested they don't behave right anymore they've been cut through so no longer are we able to trust our feelings and respond to what we're feeling because it's not connected it's not connected to anything and we don't know how to feel what to feel when to feel and we are in absolute arresting of the wound within our soul now that's the state that we're in when we are mourning when we have been in the shock and we need people just like I needed a surgeon to sew me up and I needed somebody to to help the healing process we need people to help in our healing process to find the right connection again so feeling alone because of this deep pain withdrawing because of this deep pain feeling as your as if your world has arrested while the rest of the world carries on those are feelings but they're not true feelings because number one, you are not alone. Jesus is closer to you then than he's ever been to you in other times. There are people that are waiting to help you. This is not the time to withdraw. This is the time to run into people. This is the time to draw your strength from him and for the, from those who love him. I remember when um, many years ago, uh, we had a, an incredibly wonderful youth leader in our in our church. He was 19 years old, I think. Amazing young man. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and he'd gone out with a whole lot of our youth, and um, there was a there was an electrical a live electrical wire. Excuse me. <coughs> There was a live electrical wire in the dam and he got electrocuted and he died and it was a terrible shock because a whole lot of the youth were electrocuted um he died and the man that jumped in to save him died so it was a terrible shock a terrible shock to the to the church it was a terrible shock to everybody excuse me <coughs> because of the loss of this young man we obviously just did everything we can. He drowned. He, 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 was, he was killed in, underwater and then his body was under the water and they had to find him. And um, they eventually found him. We had a church praying for him for three hours. Everybody was interceding. They found him. They went and prayed over his body for him to be raised from the dead. Um, but he never came back. And that was one of the times that I want to tell you that we were petitioning heaven and crying and, and asking God to, to, to just bring healing to this young man and to the people that were electrocuted with him who survived because he actually kicked one of them away before he eventually died. And so it was a very traumatic time. And, um, and I remember we were praying and petitioning God. We had the whole church there just petitioning heaven for about three hours for this young man. And suddenly God said to me, Kathy, I've told him he can go back if he wants to, but he doesn't want to. He's not coming back. And just like that, peace came in. And we knew that there was nothing more we could do. He had chosen to stay. As it was, and, and this is one of the cases, he had, he had spent six months making his life right. He had done everything in his power. He'd gone back and rebuilt relationships that had been broken. He'd done everything in his power. And the day that he died, he actually said to me, he said, Kathy, I've done everything I've ever wanted to do. I feel so incredibly contented because I've come home. He'd just come back from England and that afternoon he was electrocuted and died. He'd got his life perfect before God. But I remember the next day going to town and it was like the whole world was living and my world had been arrested. Everything in my heart had just stopped. And everybody else was living and doing things and moving and, and everybody was, and it was like, life's gone on, 
but my heart's arrested. And so that feeling of, of having the emotions arrested is very real because of that wound. Something has broken through, it's cut, it's hurt, and you feel arrested. And you need people to help you to come back into the wholeness and to help you to work through the trauma of the loss. And it doesn't matter what sort of a loss it is, it's always a very sim similar type of situation. But remember, Jesus is with you, and not only is he with you, so don't believe the lie that you're all alone. He is carrying you. He's the one carrying you through this time. And then he's giving you the grace that you need to be able to go right through and to start again. It's really important to see that. Friends, um, loss is a trauma and an injury to the soul, and because of that, if it's not handled properly and we don't allow the healing to happen properly, the spirit of fear will attach and people will come out of that fearing another loss, fearing it's going to happen again, fear gripping them. And in every situation, feeling fearful, anxiety, phobos, all kinds of, of um, emotional and mental problems related to a spirit of fear. Or depression will take a hold and they'll go into cycles of deep depression because they haven't allowed the healing to happen properly. Another thing that attacks in a time of mourning, if we do not deal with it properly, is suicidal thoughts and the thought of, I just want to end it all. I just want to be with them. I don't want to live anymore. And so that's another real trauma that we've got to be very careful of. And then the next thing is losing joy, losing peace, and living permanently in that pace, place of dis-ease, misery, unhappiness, mourning, permanently mourning. And often that is related to feeling betrayed. Feeling rejected, feeling helpless, feeling hopeless, feeling purposeless, feeling useless, and feeling abandoned. So many times we've got to deal with the wrong emotions that rise up there. The anger, the anger towards God, the anger towards the person that left, the anger towards that which caused the loss. And all these things are just emotions that are going crazy. And we've got to find them and bring them back into normality again. Hope deferred is a terrible thing because hope deferred makes the heart sick. And one of the big things about loss is that there was hope in things continuing and they haven't. So hope deferred becomes a really big problem. You know, friends, the only constant thing in life is change. Nothing else is constant. Change is constant. And when we've put our hope and it's never going to change, it's always going to be like this. This is the road I'm walking on forever and ever and ever with this partner, with this job, with this. That's when hope deferred gets a hold. We have to understand. We have to live present. We have to enjoy where we're living. We have to enjoy what we're living in. We have to enjoy what we're doing because you only have today. And the only thing constant is life is change. And change is continuously going to be happening. And we have to prepare ourselves in life that nothing is constant. And everything will change. And we've got to be ready to cope with that. So the Bible says in Proverbs 13 verse 12, Hope to food makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is the tree of life. And then it says in Proverbs 10 verse 28, What the righteous hope for brings joy. So we have to put our hope in Jesus and in the fact that whatever the future holds, he is our only constant and he will bring us through. And that is the way that we keep the joy of the Lord as our strength. Now to mourn well, we have to look at loss due to the death of the person or the season or the situation. Look at the shock of it. Look at the trauma of it. Look at the pain of it and look at the arrested emotions. And as I said, it feels as if the whole world is stopped. Now, mourning is the process of allowing the soul to work through what it has been confronted with. The emotions have been arrested and we need time. So the very first thing about the process of mourning is to give yourself time. Very often people have a shock or a terrible thing happening and then they immediately get into function mode and they think, well, I'll just work my way through it. My friends, you cannot work your way through a soul wound. You cannot work your way through broken heart. What happens is that you put a cover on it, but the fester happens inside and you get functional and you get driven and you just work, 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 work. But the festering of the wound is happening inside. And if you don't stop, take time, 
open the wound. Let the healing balm come in the way that they would cleanse a wound physically. It's going to make a little crust. It's going to make a little scab. And it's going to fester inside. And all of a sudden, one day, you're going to have an all fall down. You're going to have a breakdown. You're going to have a nervous breakdown. Or you're going to collapse and not be able to rise up and do the things you were called to do. So be kind to yourself. The way that you would put your arm in a cast for six weeks and not use it. The way that you would banish something that has been that has been torn muscles and not use it. In the same way, you have to give your soul time to heal. It is vital. We have to understand we cannot carry on life as normal because it's not normal. Your heart's been broken. If we do not deal with it, we will have ongoing issues with rage or self-hatred or anger towards other people or soul sicknesses like all the depressions, the, the bipolar, the, the, the false guilt, anger towards God, suicidal thoughts. It will become a lifestyle of permanently living in the state of mourning instead of mourning being a short season that we have to go through. We have to deal with it well because that ache will not go away. You can be as mentally functional as you want to, but the soul ache will not go away if you do not give yourself time to heal. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 4 says, There's a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. The joy of the new birth, the sorrow of the ending of a season. There's a time to weep and there's a time to laugh. There's a time to mourn and there's a time to dance. Friends, good times and bad times are normal. I'm going to say that again. Good times and bad times are normal. We have to become very comfortable with living in the normality of the celebration, but living in the normality of the mourning. We're living in a society that does not like people to mourn. So they drug people so they don't have to cope with the emotions of mourning. Friends, it is very important for the building of our character, for the building of the fullness of who we are meant to be in God, for us to face the celebration and the mourning and allow our emotions to grow through both of them. Because so few people face the negative things that happen in their life. They never grow emotionally and become emotionally strong. And they fall every time something negative happens. It is normal to have a time of life, a time of death, a time of weeping, a time of laughing, a time of mourning, a time of dancing. That is not unnormal. It's not unnatural. And it's not an exception to the rule. It is the balance that we have to walk to become mature and to grow and to become strong and to be able to stand no matter what happens in our life. We have to know it's a normal. So what are the, the five things, the four things that we need to be able to mourn well? The first thing is you have to give yourself time. The second thing is you have to go for treatment. Just the way that you would go for treatment when you are injured, you have to go for treatment. And I'm going to talk about the treatment in a minute. The third thing is you have to enter into the rest of God. And the fourth thing is you are stronger than you think you are. So I just want to say, no matter how weak you think you are, where you are weak, he is strong. And I've already told you that he said that he's closest to us in the time of mourning than in any other time. So what is it about time? Well, if you look at Genesis 50 verse 3, it said Joseph gave himself 70 days to be able to mourn his father. We need to take time. You need to take time, a month, two months, three months, to be able to work through the mourning process. Friends, longer than that, mourning becomes a lifestyle. Less than that, you haven't given yourself time to heal. So give yourself time to heal. Make it something that you can build into. It takes six weeks for a bone to heal. It takes six weeks for muscles and nerves to heal. Give yourself time for your heart to heal. Um, so if we look at the cycle of mourning, grief usually starts with the first thing, the sudden shock, the grief, and then people go into a season of denial. Now denial is the season when they say, I can't believe this has happened. It hasn't happened. I can't believe it feels like he's going to walk in any minute. It feels like she's going to walk in any minute. Or it feels like I'm going to get up tomorrow and I'm going to go back to my job. I cannot believe this has happened. So the emotions are saying, no, 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 no. It's not true. It's not true. It's not true. And then they move from that, from denial, into anger. 
because now suddenly the emotions are coming back and the first reaction is anger and this is when we say why did this happen i don't understand this i want answers i want answers and then we start digging for answers and and that anger is towards other people or it's towards the situation or it's towards what caused it or it's even towards ourselves because we feel i could have done something different or it's towards god why did you let this happen and eventually we move through that time of anger with the treatment which i'm going to talk to you about now and then people tend to go into depression someone could have done something i could have done something they could have done something so we go into this incredible place of depression where there's blaming and shaming and this confusion of blame and shame. It's somebody's fault and it's somebody's got to take responsibility and we go into this pit of depression. And then after that, there's often a bargaining. Well, God, if you will, then I will. God, if I will do this and this and this, if you will do that and that and that. And then there's this bargaining happening with God or even with other people. And it's all part of trying to take control, trying to have control, trying to get control back into the situation and trying to bring it into some place of normality. And then eventually there's the acceptance. It happened. But friends, in the acceptance, if we do not move then into healing and into the joy and continue living and find value and truth and hope in life again, we will move into it happened and be arrested in that place of hopelessness, helplessness, and not be able to ever live again. And too many people are arrested in that place of it happened. There's no hope. Too many people have lost their jobs and then they go into that place of it happened. I'm hopeless. I'm useless. I can't do it anymore. Instead of getting hope again and living again. So it's really important that we give ourselves time. You've got to work through that cycle. You've got to work through every one of those levels. The denial, the anger, the depression, the bargaining, the acceptance. That's the cycle you've got to work through and you need time to do that. Now I'm going to talk about the treatment. The first and most important thing about the treatment is you have to talk about the loss. So many people clam up, they close up, they don't talk about it, and that means they will start brooding. And friends, when you start brooding, there's only one other person that comes to a brood party, and that's the devil. And all that he does is adds to that with negative thoughts and deception and makes it into something it's not. It is vital that you talk to somebody about it. But who do you talk to? You have to talk to people that are spirit-filled. The Bible is very clear in Psalm 1 verse 1 to 2. It said, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the Lord. Friends, this is when we need each other. This is when we need strong Christians around us. You do not need a, a, a person that's going to counsel you according to the wisdom of this world. And you do not need sympathy. You do not need somebody that's going to sit in your pit and stroke you and make it worse for you and make you feel like you've got to stay in that place. You need somebody that says, I feel your pain. I know what you're going through. I've been there. Let me help you out of this. You need somebody that can take you through the denial and say, babe, it's happened. It's happened. It has happened. Life's going to change. It's not going to be the same again. And you know, the, tr the trouble is, friends, when we are living in the place of mourning, we don't want anybody to help us because somehow we feel, I deserve to be here, especially if there's any form of self-guilt there. Or we feel that that person wouldn't want us to continue. It would be disloyal to their love. No, you need somebody with empathy that is spirit-filled, full of the heart of God, that can love you desperately like Jesus does, have the fullness of compassion for where you're at, but can help you walk through and keep speaking truth. Remember, your emotions are everywhere. Your emotions are not operating right. Just like my thumb couldn't feel, I could burn myself because I couldn't feel. But eventually it came back. You need somebody that is stable. You need somebody whose emotions are strong. You need someone who's not shaken by what you're shaken by. But that understands your pain.
team that can help you to walk through that cycle. And when you get angry and you want to attack everybody, they can say, I understand that. But let's have a look at it and they can walk it through with you. Friends, you do not people that will leave you you do not need people that will leave you in the pit. You need people that will help you through it. And that's what Jesus did every time he had compassion. He would have compassion on the person and he would go and help them through it. And that's what we need. Do not go to the counsel of the ungodly. Do not go to the people that are going to counsel you according to the ways of this world. Do not go to people that are going to stroke you and that are going to cause you to stay in that place forever and ever and ever. Go to people that are spiritful, that are born again, that are Christians, that love you, that love God and want to help you into the fullness and into the best of what God has got for you. It's like having that wound, when you start talking about it, it's like having that wound washed and cleaned. Now I know that, you know, when, when a person has burned themselves or they've injured themselves, Sometimes cleaning that wound is incredibly painful. But if you don't clean the wound, it's going to go septic. And it's exactly the same with the soul wound, friend. Sometimes it's painful. But if you don't clean it, it's going to go septic. And you need someone to help you wash it with the Holy Spirit and with love, but with empathy to help you heal. Now, the worst thing that we can do is to dull the pain with medication. You know, when so often when people are in a shock or when people are in, in mourning, the quick and easy way is to go and get some drugs and just to dull it. Well, it's all very well momentarily because it separates you from the pain and it makes you feel like it hasn't happened. But if you do not face it, the longer it takes for you to face it, the worse it's going to get. And then you never want to face it. And so many people started on some form of a drug in a moment of, of, of trauma and in a moment of mourning and instead of facing that they were drugged out of it they were separated from it they never experienced it and then every time they come off the medication they now have to face this and sometimes it was months earlier or even years earlier and they can't face it because so much more has happened since then and so they either stay in that medicated place or they have an all fall down the moment they do have to face it. You know, I think one of the best things that used to happen for our parents or even our grandparents is that when they were confronted with a death, they had to lay out that body. I've laid out many bodies in my life. There's something incredibly healing about laying out a body. The first thing that happens is that you see that that isn't the person anymore. The second thing that happens is that you're very aware that there's, there's a sense, especially if they were born again and a Christian, there's an incredible sense of peace. But as you wash them and as you cleanse them and as you work through that and as you're mourning over them, it's the beginning of great breakthrough for healing. Today they're taken away, we don't see them, we have nothing to do with them. You then have a memorial, there's no facing it. Then they give you medication to deal with the things and we never have the opportunity of bringing closure and facing the thing that we need to have closure for. And we are left with our wounds screaming and not being able to find a solution. So it's vital that we allow ourselves to talk about it, but we talk about it to the right people that can help us to go through that cycle quickly and be the balance where our emotions don't know how to be balanced. It's really important. And they're not being mean to you. They're helping you work through it for victory. Have your time of mourning. Don't go too long because it's not lifestyle. Don't go too short because you need to heal. Have your time of mourning. But have people help you that know how to hear him how to love you, and how to bring you through in a way that's much quicker. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the power of the superimposition of God. Now, we have to understand that it says, let your kingdom come in earth as it is in heaven. That word in earth means the superimposition of God in time, place, and order. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Eternity has no time. 
the God of yesterday, today, and forever is still in yesterday. He's still in today, and he's in forever. He is still working in what was your past, but he's also working in what was your future. And I have seen on so many occasions when we've been able to go and pray for somebody in that moment and to say to them, God wants to show you the kingdom of heaven. He wants to show you what was happening in that time. He wants to superimpose that time so that you can see the bigger picture. Superimposition means to go into the ruins and to restore it back to its original plan. And I've seen so many times when we've prayed for people and we've gone back to the moment of the trauma and we've just said, Jesus, show them where you were and what you were doing. That superimposing power of God is so incredibly healing because he shows you more than you know. He shows you where he was. He shows you what he was doing. He shows you where the angels were. He shows you a far bigger picture of what happened. And I want to say this too. Many times people have come to me that have prayed for loved ones and they've said, we pray for them. But I don't think they ever found Jesus. I'm sorry, I'm just getting so getting so emotional here because I know the power of superimposition. And I've been able to pray for them. And I've been able to say, Jesus, just show them. Just show them where you were in that moment. And it's been the most incredible thing. Sometimes it was suicides. Sometimes it was something that was terrible. And in that moment, Jesus comes and he shows them. He shows them what the kingdom of heaven was doing. You see, my friends, I want to tell you something. Your prayers are as incense before the throne. You have to have a revelation of eternity to cope with mourning. And your prayers are as incense before the throne. And the Father does not let go of the prayers of the righteous. And so many times they've prayed for people, but the people have not had evidence of breakthrough on earth. And yet in that moment, they see Jesus. You see, he says, I'm closer to you. And they see the intervention of Jesus and they see how Jesus communicated with them. And they see how Jesus reached out to them and how Jesus touched them. And they see that in the final seconds, <laughs> we measure life. By moments and hours. Jesus measures life by milliseconds. And in the final milliseconds, he was able in so many occasions to reach them. And they reached out to him. Oh, the superimposition of God is such a powerful healing tool. I cannot tell you how wonderful it is and how even in my own life, I've been able to ask Jesus things and he showed me and it's brought such peace and such revelation. Friends, to mourn well, you have to have a revelation of eternity. And you have to have a revelation that eternity is just a window away. And that God of eternity is the God that's close to you. But he's connected in both realms and we can be seated with him. And he is working and he never stops working, even when we think he wasn't. So that's such a powerful thing to be able to ask Jesus to reveal what happened in the spirit realm as well as in the physical realm and to show what he was doing. It's amazing. And I've seen such healing just coming through that because suddenly it gives a completely different picture to what we thought the situation was. Point number three, under talking about it, you need people that are empathetic, not sympathetic. You need people that will help you through, not leave you there. The next thing is to make sure there are no regrets. And once again, friends, with the superimposition of God, it's just such a wonderful thing. You know, you may not have had time to tell that person how much you love them. You may not have said goodbye to them. You might have had a fight with them. There might have been all kinds of situations that were wrong. That left you feeling so terrible, so much regret. Well, in the superimposition of God, it's just such a wonderful thing. How you are able to go before the Father. And I always say to people, write a letter. Write a letter to that loved one. Telling them everything you ever wanted to say to them. Telling them when, you, when they made you mad. Telling them the things that, that broke your heart. 
but telling them how much you love them, telling them what you wanted to say to them, telling them what was on your heart that you never had the opportunity to do. Write a letter. And then I take that letter with them. I never read it because it's not addressed to me. And then we pray over that letter. And I ask for the superimposition of Jesus Christ, the one who's with us, but he's also with them, to come into the situation. And we ask him to post the letter. And it's the most wonderful thing, friends, because it brings such closure to that which was regrets and to that which so many people live with and becomes false guilt and it becomes such a deep sense of loss without any way of bringing any closure into that loss. It's an amazing thing to write a letter and to give it to Jesus and ask him to post it. And then we burn it because it's nobody else's business. It's just between the one writing it, the one that they wanted to give it to, and the mediator, which is Jesus. Wonderful. The next thing is to deal with any, so this is point number four, deal with any false guilt or shame that's been attached. So many are, are not able to get to the sick and loved ones, especially in this time. So many of them feel uh, tormented because they haven't been able to get there. We are in war, friends. We are in war. And in war times, things are not normal. In war times, people were, were sent to other countries and they died in other countries and they were not able to get to them. We are in war. Except it's not the same type of war. We're in war against a virus. We're in war against against um, violence and lawlessness and everything else. And our, our, our bodies are in a complete sense of, of being on guard all the time because we're in war. And our people are taken to hospital. We can't get to them. We can't pray for them. We can't love them. We can't be there for them. And so guilt comes in. I could have done more. I should have done more. I, I, I should maybe have. And all kinds of guilt comes in. Do not let guilt come in. It's false guilt and it's torment. You know that you did, you did what you could. Anything beyond that you feel you could have or should have done better, go back into that place of no regrets and speak to them in a letter so that God can bring healing in that. But do not allow false guilt or shame to take a hold because false guilt and shame result in control and fear coming in and trying to hold on and it's birthed in, de in deception friends if they've had a day that god ordained for them to go home nothing you could have done would have changed that if the enemy has stolen from their life it's not because of something you did it's because of another way that he came in then we ask god for the opportunity to pray them back to life but if we can't every single one of us will love eternity more than we love this world Every single one of us would rather be there than being here. Rejoice because of where they are. Work through the sadness because of what you've lost. But don't allow false guilt to hold on to something that God doesn't want you to hold on to. The next point, it's really important that we ask people to pray for the trauma of our soul. It's really important that we get other people to pray with us, that superimposition, that dealing with the trauma. It's really important that you're vulnerable about the trauma. It's really important that you say, my heart's broken, that you're vulnerable. Friends, if we are not vulnerable with each other, we can't care for each other. And putting up a thing to say, I'm fine, when you're not fine, is not fine. Because it's festering inside. So it's really, really important. We need each other more now than we ever have. The church has been shut. The doors of the church has been shut. But don't let the heart of the church be shut. Because church is people. And we need to be there for each other now more than ever. The Bible says in Hebrews 10 verse 23 to 25. Let us hold unanswerably to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Hold unanswerably to the hope. Hope. Never lose hope. It's a season change. It's a situation change. But do not lose hope. Because the God of the hope and the hopeful and the purpose of your life, the one that created you with a purpose and a plan for good and not evil, has not changed his mind about you. He who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur each other on towards love and good deeds. Friends, our role is to spur each other on. 
I might be heartbroken and sitting down today. Your job is to spur me on to keep going. You might be heartbroken and sitting down. My job is to spur you on to keep going. Then it goes on to say in Hebrews 10, Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. No matter which way we look at it and no matter how much we want to admit it or not, we truly are in the final hour. Things truly are speeding up. And it says, even more when we see the day, day approaching, let us not give up meeting together. Friends, we need each other now more than ever. I need to be vulnerable with you and you need to be vulnerable with me. It is not a sign of weakness to say, I am battling. The sign of weakness is trying to be strong in your own strength. Because Jesus says, where you are weak, I am strong. So when we can admit and be vulnerable about feeling weak, we draw strength from him. But we can also have strength from each other. It is vital to be real with each other. Friends, we cannot have a mask. We cannot have a facade. The days of putting on the mask for church is over. Because church is each other. And we've got to be real with each other. And then the next point, I said to you that we needed to talk, but to the right people, that we needed to give ourselves time. It's vital to have time. It's vital to have rest. And friends, rest means to enter into rest, to enter into times of worship. And what does it mean to enter into rest? It means you go and sit in the presence of God and you say, Father, speak to me. You don't come with a shopping list of things that you want to ask him for. You just say, I need you to speak to me. You sit there in the presence of worship music or soaking music. You put, shut the doors to everything else. You go into the Sabbat, that place of peace. The kingdom of heaven is righteousness, peace and joy. And you go into that atmosphere of righteousness, peace and joy created by worship. And you say, Dad, speak to me. Holy Spirit, overwhelm me. Jesus and fix your eyes on Jesus see him enter into Psalm 23 the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures he makes you rest he restores your soul and if you just enter into those times of rest and say I need my soul restored I need you to work with my broken heart it's you and me Papa it's you and me and you fix your eyes on Jesus in that field and you let him come and minister to you it's the most incredible wonderful restoration of the soul friends nothing can restore your soul but Jesus nothing you can take anything you want nothing can you store your soul but Jesus that same scripture goes on to say even though I walk not I sit not I stand, not I lie down in the valley of the shadow of death. I walk. We walk through valleys of shadows of death. There's a beginning, there's an end. And you don't stop until you've walked through. I will fear no evil. Do not let fear grip you in the valley of the shadow of death. Because his rod and his staff comfort me. So when you're going through the valley of loss, when you're going through the valley of grieving, when you're going through the valley of the shadow of death, know that he's with you, his rod and his staff is with you. Just keep walking until you get to the other end and do not let fear grip. This is not going to happen over and over and over and over again. This is the season. Remember, there's a time for laughter. There's a time for mourning. So out of mourning comes laughter and we've got to find the time. For laughter even though I walk through and then it's really important to be able to accept it but in acceptance friends do not say why God one thing I've learned in my life God doesn't answer why he just never answers why so we need to ask him something else we rather say God what did you want me to learn God what do you want me to change in my life God how can I grow through this God how do you want me to empower others through this? Those are the questions we ask. And that's the acceptance we move into. It's happened. Now what, God? How do you want me to walk out of this? And friends, when you do that, you won't get stuck in that place of mourning forever. I love the passage of scripture 
that David uh, spoke in 2 Samuel 12, verse 22 to 24a. David had fasted and prayed for his son and for the grace of God because his son was dying. And he had fasted and he prayed and he wouldn't let anyone come near him. He was weeping and he was wailing. But once the boy died, David got up and ate, saying, Now that he is dead, what is the point of fasting? Can I bring him back? I will be going to be with him, but he cannot come back to me. Then David got up and he consoled his wife, Bathsheba. Friends, there's a time of accepting it. They're not coming back, but you are going to be with them. Now go and console others. The morning stops when you accept that it's happened. But now what are you going to do out of that? You're going to use it to become a tool of love. He takes our ashes and he makes them into something beautiful. It is vital that we then remember the good times, but don't brood on the good times. It says in Isaiah 43 verse 18, forget the former things and do not dwell on the past. Be, uh, to be able to move forward, you've got to have hope in the future. I had a great time. That was wonderful. The memories are great. It was so good. That was such a vital part of my life. But we don't focus on that, friends. We look forward. The moment that we focus on what was past, we stop living. God never wants us to stop living. They will always be part of you. Remember, eternally it's part of you. But look forward. Look forward to the new day, to the new hope, to the new vision, to the new things that God wants to do in the next season of your life. That season is completed for that person, for that situation, for that time, for that job. But there is a new season and you've got to find that and you've got to walk it into the fullness. And if you take time to heal, you'll be able to move into that far, far easier with joy. And we have to find our joy. Psalm 16 verse 11 says, in his presence is fullness of joy. You know, the most amazing thing is when your heart's broken, but you can still find joy. And that's what it means when you come into the presence of God. And that's how we can live again. And that's how we can dream again. And that's how we can build again. Do not expect things to be the same. They'll never be the same again. But you'll have a new normal and a new, a new delight and a new joy and a new season. And it will become a new destiny for you. It won't look like that, but it'll be great. To fulfill all the days ordained for us, we need to live in victory we need to learn how to walk through the good and through the loss and how to put them together and to find victory in who we are in who he is and to know it's just part of the facets of the diamond of who he's made us to be we need to walk in the joy of the lord and we need to know that the lord is our strength we need to find rest in his presence because only god can take a mess and turn it into a message can take a test and turn it into a testimony can take a tragedy and turn it into a triumph and can take a victim and make them victorious what does restoration look like friends psalm 30 verse 5 11 and 12 says weeping will last for a night but joy comes in the morning he turned my morning into dancing he took my sackcloth and clothe me with garments of joy so that I may praise him and not remain silent. The Lord my God, I will give you thanks forever. Isaiah 61 verse 3 says, He provided for those who grieve in Zion and then bestowed on them the crown of beauty for ashes. Friend, you may be the one grieving in Zion today. But there's a crown of beauty for ashes if you allow yourself to heal well. Psalm 84 verse 6 says, As I pass through, once again passing through, you don't lie there, you don't stop there, you don't sit there, you don't wait for people to stroke you there, you don't wait for people to feel sorry for you there, you walk through with the one who's got the rod and the staff. As I pass through the valley of Becca, which means the valley of tears, they make it a place of springs, of blessing, prosperity, praise, and peace. The very place where your heart was broken will become the place of the greatest blessing in your life. Joy is the strength we will need to rebuild. Nehemiah understood that very well. 
We said in Nehemiah 8 verse 10, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Friends, mourning, though it is extremely painful, is a vital part of our growth. If we mourn well, it will be a pause until we continue into a new destiny. But if we do not mourn well, it becomes a full stop and we can never move on. I know too many people in life whose lives stopped the day tragedy came and they've just been breathing and eating since then, but they've never lived again. God calls us friends to mourn, to mourn well, to take time, to go to the right people to help you that are empathetic, but can help you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, to enter into his rest, to find his joy again, to find peace again, and to dream again, and then to build with the joy of the Lord being your strength. He will turn your mourning into joyful dancing. God bless you, my beautiful, beautiful friends. And in this time where so many are mourning, so many have had loss. In fact, it's affected every single one of us. But know this, God is in it. He's with you. He's walking through with you. Every single one of us are learning to have more empathy, to help each other more, to be closer to each other. And it's an incredible preparation because Jesus is coming back soon. And the body of Christ needs to be united like never before. And as we reach out for each other and help each other and walk each other through these heartbreaking times, our hearts are knitted like never before. God bless you. Mourn well and live again. Goodbye.